When I finally found design as a calling, I, I feel very lucky that I don't have this core idea of where beauty starts and ends. I am just always willing to to be like, wow, okay, okay, cool. That is that is also beautiful. And I, I think that that's a real gift my mother gave me. Hey everyone, I'm Amy Devers. I'm Jamie Derringer, and this is Clever. Today we're talking to Anna Monroe. Anna's a designer currently working as a civil servant in a government think tank, helping to solve complex social challenges. She studied history at Columbia and got an MFA from Art Center in Media Design Practices. And in between those two degrees, she got a lot of hands-on experience and on-the-job training as a production designer in the fashion and entertainment worlds. She's also a fine artist and a technologist. And, well, a total deep-thinking badass who's lending her talents to the greater good. Let's talk to Anna. My name is Anna Monroe. I'm lucky enough to have three homes. I think the first one is in rural Georgia. It's a it's not a town or even a city. It's a village called Sylvania, Georgia. And then there's New York City, which is a town and a city. And then there's Los Angeles, California, also a city. So very lucky to be able to go between those three places. I am a I'm a designer. I don't I don't like to say I'm a service designer or an industrial designer because I think that's too limiting. I like to say I'm a designer. And currently I am a public servant in the federal government. Um, and I work at the lab at OPM. I've always been drawn to design. I think that working in the federal space is not a place that I ever would have thought that I'd end up. And kind of before we proceed, I do need to say for the record, nothing I say here is representative of the federal government. And also, um, I'm officially on leave right now, so I get to have opinions, which is quite nice. Uh, you can't have opinions, you know, during the workday, <laughs> as as you know. We can ah, yeah, okay. time then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I requested it. I, like, requ- I had to request to be on this podcast, and I had to get the okay, and then I had wow. to like, request to be on leave. My boss is great, though. She, the requests were sort of me being like, hey, can I do this? And she was like, yeah, you're fine. Awesome. But yes, she had to file papers. Papers were filed. Okay. Wow. All right. Yeah. So clever so- somewhere on the record in the government. Yeah, somewhere. (laughs) All right. So we we love to go back to the beginning. I really want you to take us back to your youth. Where were you raised? What was your family dynamic like? What kinds of things were you into as a kid? I guess going all the way back to the beginning, I was born in, in 1981 in Augusta, Georgia. My town is too small to have a hospital. Like to this day, there's no hospital. We actually lived in South Carolina at the time, but we had to commute across the border to get me born. My parents, I think they continue to be quite formulative to me because they are liberals in the small town in the southern United States, which is a tough place to be, especially at this moment. And that was a huge influence on me. I was never taught to sit down because I was told to sit down. I was always taught to not burn things to the ground, but also not submit. And my parents are very much the reasons for that. So my mother's actually from Central America. She's from Panama. And she like has these like massive Latina curls and like coarse black hair. Now she straightens it and that's irritating for me because I love her <laughs> curls and and that was a big part of my childhood. Yeah, I have super straight hair. Um and I thought that curls were what would happen when I became a grown up. Like I really thought, <laughs> that, oh, when I when I'm a late when I'm a woman, I'm going to have curly hair. And then around like age 16 I realized that would just never happen, which was sad. And she was my first like an emblem of beauty. And my dad owned radio stations. So my mom is a public school teacher. My dad owned radio stations, which he'd always wanted to do. And they are a wonderful duo. He is a banker's kid from from small town, southern family. Like he's a little southern prince, has every possibility of becoming a total jerk. And he just is is not a total jerk. He's a he's an expansive thinker. And he married my mother, this like take no shit Central American immigrant, daughter of a secretary and a house painter. And they married in 1970 in rural Georgia and they have never looked back. And it's so empowering and I love it. So that that was my first big influence for my parents, just like not accepting the status quo as something that had to be the way it is. And that has influenced my practice a lot. 
That is interesting to me because the picture you've painted is of these really empowered people that are not, I don't want to say fish out of water, but they're a little bit iconoclastic for their locale. And yet they're Absolutely. choosing to stay, not migrating to somewhere else where their ideas and their liberalness might be, um, you know, more, they might find more like-minded people. But in that way, it's it's a sort of hospitable activism. That's so well stated. I, I yeah, I never really thought of it that way. In fact, I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they do it. I don't know how they haven't left. And sometimes my mother does like muse longingly for some like ridiculously liberal place like San Francisco. She's like, oh, God, maybe I could live there. Uh Um, The thing is, I think that they really um, thrive on the idea of hope Mm -hmm. that if you stay in it, if you have pressure and time, then things can be changed for the better. And I think that's their ethos. So, yeah. Yeah. And it sounds like also... It's more modeling it than than forcing it, and and it's born of a respect as well. Like there's no disrespect for the people that are around there. That's why they choose to live there. It's just they're going to be who they are, and they're going to be there in that space. Yeah, absolutely. Let me tell you one quick story about my dad. So he owned radio stations, and and owning local radio stations is you know as powerful a position as any other media company. Mm-hmm. And in the sometime in the seventies, I want to say in our small town, this um, this group toured through, just a folk group, and my dad liked their music and played it on his radio station. And the story goes, the town fathers, like some of these like old men who ran the town, called him up and said, "You, you need to take those those boys off the radio." And my father said, "Why?" And they said, "Well, they're not Christian because they were actually, um, I think they're Buddhist." And my father said, "Well." It's my radio station. I'm going to play whatever I want. And that has always stuck with me. Wow. You can't bow. You can't You can't burn it to the ground. Don't, like, don't get out there and try to bust some noses. But don't, don't submit either. Wow. That is a model. <laughs> I mean, I can imagine growing up in that. <laughs> and, I, and now it's, it's starting to make sense how you became who you are. But like, how is your creativity starting to manifest? Well, I think so. My dad was around radio stations. And in the 60s, I guess, when he was in college, there was no broadcast radio major. You became an electrical engineer so that you could build your own transformers. And so that's really where I learned to first be creative is I had this spot behind his door in the office, in his office, that was had two tool kits that were old and they were full of parts and like needle nose pliers and and just the old rusted ones that he didn't use anymore. And I would spend hours behind that door on this orange carpet. The carpet was orange (laughs) in his office building things. And I loved that. And it's still something I really love. I always love to work with my hands. I like a very, I have a very tangible sort of making based practice, but I never really connected that to design early on because I thought that to be a designer, you had to be a kid who liked to draw. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't a kid who drew. I was a kid who touched things. You know, like, I don't know if y'all ever went to church, but I'm from the South and we went to church. It was a more restrained version of Christianity. And I would like to, it was the 80s. So we had all these wonderful like outfits and like rayon and things like that Mm -hmm. and crocodile skin belts and like massive poofy shoulder pads. And I loved to go up to the ladies and ask if I could touch them. (laughs) And yeah, I know the privileges of childhood and you're like, Hey, can I touch that? And then you just kind of put out your hand. And so I just did this like all the time. And I always like, I always wanted to like make things with my hands and, and build things. I never thought I could ever be a designer because designers, you know, they draw. That's what those kids do. You know, it's funny. I grew up not being able to draw either. And so I just kind of thought that I wasn't creative. It's, it, yeah, I just, <laughs> I don't know. I guess I'll do business because I can't draw. And it's like, so, <laughs> so fun. And obviously I'm not a business person. So anyway, <laughs> I love that Me orange either. carpet made such an impression on you. We we talked to somebody else and the purple carpet on some stairs, like is lodged in her memory forever. So just FYI, interior design really does make a difference. It does. I mean, I still wonder who picked out that orange carpet. Like, why? It was 
so orange. <laughs> My grandparents had this orange carpet too, and it was so cool. And like growing up, I was always like, man. What an odd selection. <laughs> like, because I felt like my grandparents were like pretty mainstream. Like, there was nothing quirky or unique about them except this orange carpet. Yeah. These choices, I think, especially in the 70s, were just very, I think it was a very joyful time. It was very experimental. <laughs> and I thought, why not? I guess the other way that I, I was starting to be creative is because of my parents' like dichotomy. I think that one of the most important things that my my mother taught me is the the sort of unlimited depth of beauty that there is no there's no standard beauty. Standard beauty doesn't exist. Beauty is all of the things all at once depending on where you look at it. So we had a lot of serious talks when I was growing up about how her curls or her dark skin and and my flat hair and my white skin they were both so beautiful and we would she would purposefully take me to places like New Orleans and we would stay in predominantly black neighborhoods or we would stay in predominantly Latino neighborhoods when we could in other places because, and she told me this, because you need to learn that you're not the standard. And so when I finally found design as a calling, I, I feel very lucky that I don't have this core idea of where beauty starts and ends Mm -hmm. I am just always willing to to be like, wow, okay, okay, cool. That is that is also beautiful. And I, I think that that's a real gift my mother gave me. That is really powerful. Teaching them how to see the world is a really important gift as a parent. And if you can teach them to see the world in their own way and view it with curiosity and seek understanding. Hmm. Yeah, I I totally agree. I think that that's a really big that's going to be or emerging as a really big part of the next generation of designers as well. We can't have a limited view. Mm -hmm. The world is small and crowded and we have to be able to, to see from other people's perspectives as well as ourselves. So that's definitely something that I bring into my practice is this idea that like, Oh, well you may have an answer. You may not have an answer. It's okay. Let's, we can, we can get there together. I really believe in like collaboration so you're talking about the future of design and de that designers need to see the, the full picture. But I'm really interested in this idea of modern history, which you studied at Columbia. Um, th there's yeah. definitely a link here between what happened in the past and what's happening in the future. And I think that if you could speak maybe to why you arrived at the choice of studying modern history and maybe how that kind of informed you to what you're doing now. To be very honest, and this does not sound nice, I think I needed to get out of the South. I The South is a complicated place to be from. You're sort of constantly defending it and also constantly being completely horrified by it. This past month has been a pretty horrifying time, and I apologize for my state, but I needed to get out. And so the only way for me to get out was to get into the best school I possibly could get into. And, and for my family, that meant I needed to go... I needed to really shoot for the top. And I was very good at history. I have a good memory. Yeah, I am a fast reader kind of thing. And so my entire high school was very focused on like, how can I be so good that I can just, I can get out of here? Because I did not like it. I was not like the other girls, I would say. <laughs> I studied modern history at Columbia because I love history, but I also studied it because it was a way to get out of the small town South and, and, I don't know, somehow saying it, it sounds quite terrible, but that is the truth of the matter. And I found it very interesting. I I studied how wars begin. I studied the breakdown in diplomacy prior to World War II. And then I wanted to do my thesis on actually the airline, the design of airline uniforms during the Cold War. So during the middle part of the 20th century, all airlines were nationally owned. So Aeroflot was owned by the Soviet government, and we had Pan Am here. It was heavily subsidized by the U.S. government and all these other ones. And there was a very, very overt, like, national propaganda thing going on with their, like, branding and their uniform design. Mm -hmm. And this was, like, way before I entered design. I just, like, thought this was very interesting and liked fashion. <laughs> And so I proposed this as my thesis at Columbia, but Columbia is quite snobby and conservative, and they told me I couldn't do that. So I said, okay, can I, can I 
do is my thesis that how the propaganda films, the cartoons, um, I don't know if you've ever seen them. There's like these great 1940s cartoons that like cautioned sailors not to get drunk in ports and like spill naval secrets and stuff like that. Mm. And I was like, can I study how those got made? Like how did some senator get the idea that we need to tell like the privates or whatever how to behave and we're going to do it through the mechanism of a cartoon? Like how did that happen? And again, this is way before I was a designer. I like did not know I was going to become a designer. I was a historian. I was going to be a lawyer. And they said, no, you can't do that. It's not serious enough, not Columbia. And I said, OK. And so I ended up writing my thesis on the American occupation of Japan, which was totally fine. It was just like deeply boring and no one should ever read that thesis. <laughs> and years later, I was in the San Francisco International Airport and there was a Royal College of Art exhibit with all of the airline uniforms. <gasps> lined up and I was like oh my gosh I was simultaneously like deeply insulted and also very gratified yes I was like it is a thing <laughs> so yeah that is that's that's what happened when I was a historian and and it it helps me in my design practice because I can do a ton of research and remember a lot of stuff but pretty much as soon as I graduated and my parents said they weren't gonna contribute to law school I said great I'm not gonna go <laughs> I'm going to be a designer. Nice. Saved by the bell, sort of. (laughs) Oh, my God. I have, I'm so, every morning I wake up and think, I'm so glad I'm not a lawyer. No offense to any lawyers. It just wasn't (laughs) you. Yeah. Yeah. But so I'm really interested about your professional life and how it got started after your history degree because from what I read, you started as a translator as an, at an Apple store, which I don't even know what that means, and then went into becoming a stylist. And growing into becoming a full-on production designer for both photographic stills and motion pictures. So not to mention, you also developed a mobile app and did the UX design (laughs) for a communication mobile app. So this is all very rich and layered, and I need you to break it down for us. Yeah, thanks. I uh, I've never thought of it quite in that like that rapid succession. And you're right; it sounds so random. Oh my gosh. Okay, let me let me do this. All right. So, I I love history. I respect my degree. It's fantastic. But I the thing that you do when you graduate from Columbia with a history degree is you become a lawyer. Columbia is very good at producing lawyers. And I looked at my life and I thought, do you want to be in your office at nine thirty on a Friday night? when you're 28 because at this point I was like what 21 22 because that's the reality for me like to pay for law school I would have to enter a really competitive firm and they uh they just grind people they they just kill them um they take all their hours and I was like no I don't want to do that I mean why do I want to owe a firm like my 20s I'm not going to do that I'm going to go have fun so I thought I wanted to be a designer I did not want to pay for design school not having any idea if I actually liked it or not I got a job as a translator in an Apple store because I spoke a lot of languages because I kind of have a talent for languages. And so I just I ended up at Columbia just taking a lot of language classes because they were really high points. So, you know, like you have to take like, I don't know, whatever it is, 14 credits a semester or whatever, 12. And the language classes all counted for like four and five points. So you could take fewer classes because they were so valuable. Oh. So I just took a lot of them and I just didn't have many class hours, which was delightful. So then I graduated and my saleable skill was I was good at languages. And so I, I went and worked for Apple and Soho for a while while I figured out how to be a designer. And if you're me, how you are a designer is you get a job being a production coordinator, which is a person who like makes lots of phone calls and organizes photo shoots. And I did that for like 10 months. And by the end of the 10 months, the company had me like writing budgets, which I was very insulted by because I hadn't gotten a raise. And I I feel very strongly about like, you know, you got to be paid. And I'd started out this person who just, you know, answered the phone and like filed things. And then by the 10 months later, I was like doing the the budgets and all this stuff. And I was like, oh, you need to pay me more. And they said, no, I'm not going to do that. And so I got fired. Like it was bad. I got fired. You know, there's no sugarcoating it. But yeah, I love it. That's that. Don't burn down bridges, but also don't back down. <laughs> yes. Oh my God, you're right. Holy. Yeah. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. I was to this day. I'm so I'm so annoyed that I got fired, but I think it's it's fine. So in the meantime, I had actually met a woman 
at a party. This is like a very Southern thing, right? We believe in parties. You go to parties. That's where all the connections happen. Southern people, very social. So I got myself invited to these these like fashion and film world parties because I'm 22 and 23 in New York City. And I don't know, you get yourself invited places. And I met this woman and I was like, I think I want to be a production designer, a set designer. And she said, okay, well, you should quit your job and be my assistant. And I said, okay, that sounds crazy. And then I got fired. So I called her up and I was like, hey, um, remember how you said that I could be your assistant? Could I do that now? And she was like, um, maybe. And so then I knew that this connection that I thought I had was not a thing that would like, let me pay my rent next month. Mm-hmm. Like I, I'm definitely one of those people that I had to pay my rent. Like I'm not, I don't, I don't know. I just, I needed to work for money. And so I started making calls, like cold calls. Like I had a list of like stylists that I had kind of put together from various sources and I would call them on a rotation of every, I think I gave them every nine days so they didn't get annoyed with me. Cause I had this theory that if you just hang out for long enough, somebody will hire you to like pack boxes for them. And that ended up being true. So I spent, you know, eventually this lady that I met did in fact bring me on as her full-time assistant and I learned tons, but I spent a lot of years, maybe like three or four just doing the assistant thing in New York City on on photo shoots mostly. And I was really lucky to get in at a high level. I was able to work for Vogue. I was able to work for Neiman Marcus. I was able to work for Glamour Magazine and things like that. And I met, you know, your general sort of mixture of people, some who are really great, some who are total jerks. And I learned, though I didn't know it at the time, I learned how to be the boss I always wanted to have and never got to have. Like, Being on set taught me not only the kind of practicalities of design, like color and shape, texture, scale. Mm -hmm. It also taught me how to hire and fire Teamsters, how to negotiate with a with an elevator like person, you know, the person who does the elevator to like make sure my stuff got up there Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. doing the budgets, all those like dumb practical things that I feel like a lot of designers don't get in school, certainly but have really been an asset to me. So I had this extremely hands-on learning experience for design through working in fashion in New York City. And I learned a lot from from those people I assisted. And then the recession came Ah. and it all fell apart. Like it all fell apart. Yeah. What recession are we talking about? 2008, 2007? Yeah, 2008. Yeah, the 2007, 2008, I was, I actually was doing my biggest job that I'd ever gotten. It was so cool. It was this like installation for Fashion Week for this awesome brand called Loric. And I had a staff of like 30 something people. We did, I don't know, 11 sets or something. And the clothes were beautiful and everyone was there. And in the middle of the build, we all got the word that Lehman had crashed. Oh. And I thought, okay. I have six months on the books and I had just left my assistant gig. I literally had one of our assistants come to my set and I'd handed him back my, um, the person I was working for frequently, that lady I mentioned her credit card because I, the, the relationship had gotten bad, you Mm -hmm. know, like she didn't want me to move on and she also didn't want to give me more money. And I was like, I don't know what to do here. I don't want to be somebody's assistant forever. And I had six months of work on the books for myself. And so I had handed that credit card back like the day before or something ridiculous. So we got, so we got this text from our, you know, on our phones or whatever it was and Lehman and Crash and everyone thought, okay, well, that's interesting. Wonder what will happen. Well, we all know what happened. Like I, we worked for that six months. Like, you know, if you were me, you worked for that six months. And then it just was like crickets. Mm-hmm. For like oh, a no. year and a half, it was devastating. Yeah, and I remember that that recession was hard on everyone, but the fashion industry was particularly hit because the consumer, the fashion buying public, like that's one of the first things they stop buying. They just it's luxury or it's not it's considered non essential, or you, when you yeah. start tightening your belt, you mm-hmm. literally stop buying extra jeans. Um. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Was that when you decided to go back to school or when you decided to build an app? What the hell, man? Oh, yeah. Well, here's the thing. I didn't decide to go back to school because everyone was going back to school and nobody knew how long this recession was going to last. And I didn't want to graduate with 
I'm, I'm very logical. I didn't want to graduate with debt into a recession, mm-hmm. right? I was like, what if it's still happening? I'm going to like eke it out. And so what I decided to do was to go into more of the film side because the film side had unions or has unions. Um, and the film side has like labor laws. And I thought I need more structure. Mm-hmm. Like this has been fantastic. But fashion, to your point, is so um, up and down. It's very market driven. I need a little bit more stability. And so that's when I started putting the word out that I wanted to work in LA. And I started going out to LA quite a lot and then finally moved there. And that's when I kind of stopped working in fashion and started working in in TV and film, which was another great design learning experience. Got through the recession. I was actually like, I, I got a, a, another job. Like I was actually, a, I was like a hostess and like a coat check girl. And that was extremely difficult for me because- you know, I had been running multiple teams around New York City, like going to fancy sets and like all these things. But I think it was very important for me because I learned I learned to never expect that things are going to work out. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also learned that I am, in fact, a, a, a quote unquote real designer, like the love never left me. I would just I remember I had no money. Right. And so I made for my uh, for my Christmas gifts. Oh, they were all handmade. I think many people did it probably in those years. And I made for my brother this, um, I went to the fashion district. I got this length of cashmere blanketing and I embroidered because I had a lot of time because I was unemployed. Mm -hmm. I embroidered (laughs) on it this Raymond Carver poem. And that's when I knew. I knew like, okay, I'm for real into this. This is not a thing that's going to go away. So eventually, you know, work picks up. I'm working in TV and film. I moved to L.A., LA is great for me. I love Los Angeles and I love it a lot. And I promise I'm getting to Dakota. I love it a lot because I get to speak Spanish there. So I wasn't raised speaking Spanish. My my dad is an engineer. He speaks math and English, but my mom is a Spanish teacher. Okay. So I like sat in ninth grade Spanish one class and I was like, so excited to learn Spanish. And so I started studying and then I like practiced with my mom. It was super fun. And then I moved to LA and I got to see Spanish like every day. And it was so fun. So I was like, all right, well, I used to work for Apple and I know a lot of languages and I speak Spanish pretty well at this point. I'm going to make an app so that I can go to grad school. So I never had any illusions that this app would like get me venture capital money and make me rich. But I did have ambitions that this app could could showcase another set of like interests and work for me that you can't see through my film work. This was a portfolio um, project. It was a very serious portfolio yes. project. Okay. Like, okay. It was a deeply serious, like fully built. Despite the recession, I had I had bought Apple at like 54 back when I worked for Apple. And so I had this money because Apple at this point was worth a lot of money. And so I sold some of that stock and that's how I funded the engineers. Wow. Um, yeah. And it was super fascinating. And I and I remember sitting in investor meetings when I built out the deck for it and and the investors who are all men saying things like, so the idea with decoder is you set your own code your, and then you texted it and the code was all emojis. Mm-hmm. So if I'm texting you all, I can set a code it arrives on your phone in decoder and it's all these emojis that I've I've cr- I've set up for us and it's like emoji message and an english message and like then the english disappears after a few seconds ah and it was 2012 so you have your own secret language with with somebody that's 100% okay and you have the yeah. the english message for a short short period of time so you can understand the emoji message but then you start to understand the code and you can speak only in emoji yeah, you can totally memorize it. And people did. Uh-huh. I was really surprised. Like early users were like, oh, yeah, we don't even use the thing anymore. I was like, whoa, really? That's crazy. <laughs> you know, like that's I didn't anticipate that at all. But I couldn't get any funding for it because people didn't get it. It was like 2012. People were like, why would you want your text to disappear? And I was like, I just just trust me. I think we're going to want that. You were like mm-hmm. way too ahead of and ahead of the time. <laughs> I was like super. <laughs> I was too early. It was not a good look. I ended up. I got the patents on it because I wanted to have the patents on it. I actually have a patent that when Snapchat filed, they uh, my patent was extant, and so they wrote a patent in a different way, and that's you know very nice for them. But I kind of feel very justified by like, oh yeah, I predate Snapchat. Awesome. <laughs> so I used that. I was kind of looking at my possibilities and running out of money again. And 
I knew I didn't want to stay in film because I didn't want to have like a 5 a.m. call time in Irvine, California or wherever, like Mm -hmm. when I was 50. Also, I'm just like, I was like, again, the structure is just, I didn't think I would make it, you know, it's for better or worse. I'm a pretty cerebral person and that is not valued that highly in a film, I would say. So I was like, you need to go to school. It's time. You have, uh, it's not a recession anymore. You feel safe. Obama is the president. Cool. So I, I applied to Art Center and I got in. <laughs> and I could become a real designer. You know, somebody hands me a, a document that says designer on it. And I'm Certified, like, okay, bonafide designer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Instead of this like fake one I've done all these years. <laughs> So that sounds like it was a pretty important step. And do you feel like you were able to aggregate all of your various interests and put them into practical application and execution in Art Center? I do. I swear I don't know how people get through grad school if they haven't been in film before. It was so hard. It was like drawing on everything I'd ever learned to get through that grad school. Because I went to a very tough program where we went to like Uganda, which is in East Africa, and we worked with UNICEF and like it was extremely self-directed. And I made a production schedule for myself. I was like, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this. And also being your own studio makes you very like independent and dare I say pushy. Mm -hmm. And so I was totally okay being like, I need this from the school and I don't need this. And no, I'm not doing that. And I was also like 32 Whereas the other cohort members were like 24. And I was just like, I'm not putting up with that. <laughs> you, no, I, I wish I had done. I've done some work in production, too. And I wish I had done it before grad school. But I will say I had work experience and I was older. And that made all the difference because you do need to be so self-driven in grad school. Yeah. And you really need to have that work experience. I just think it helps you navigate with so much more clarity. I completely agree. I don't know how people go from from undergrad to grad school and survive I know. at all. <laughs> but but <laughs> it was really hard. You survived and you got an MFA in the Media Design Practices program. Yes. And yeah. for the last couple of years, I'm dying to hear about this because I really need you to help me wrap my head around it. Um, for the last couple of years, you've been a public servant, specifically what they call a human innovation fellow for the lab Ugh. at the office Nerds. OPM, which is the, what was the office of what? It's the office of personal management. Okay. It is literally government HR. Like we call the snow days. Okay. That's what we do. So yeah. it's a federal government think tank. And just, I have to say this, I copied this from the website and I need our listeners to hear it so that they can kind of get the gist. But the lab is both a practice and a space that fosters innovation through human centered design. Their goal is to reach their goal is to teach human centered design across the federal government and to help deliver innovative solutions that address complex public and cross sector challenges. So that's fascinating. And you need to elaborate on this so that we can understand what you do. (laughs) So it is a practice and a space if you want to be very (laughs) kind of pretentious about it. I would say that what the lab does, what we do there is, first of all, at a very basic level, we are actual designers in government, and that is not easy to do. We have to be um, on this fellowship thing because the government, the federal government doesn't have any way to hire a designer. Design is an extremely new job in, in your, if your timeline is the timeline of governments, like, which is, you know, 25 years, lifetimes long, that's your timeline. Mm -hmm. So there's no way to hire us. Like they don't know how to do it. Many, many agencies want to hire designers and and the lab helps them do it now because they figured out how to do it. We do teach a lot of the human-centered design practice. In fact, I'm um, the the lead designer on a guide series for human-centered design in the public sector. I just spoke at the International Design and Government Conference, which is run by the UK gov design group out in San Francisco last week. And it's it's amazing community to be a part of if you are a designer who wants to give back and who is like deeply optimistic and able to navigate complex situations, I would say. Yeah. And it sounds like research, your research background is probably enormously helpful too. Yeah, it, it is. It definitely is. That's really well, um, well spotted. I am 
having a historian's background gives me a lot of context for why bureaucrats behave the way they do. It also gives me the ability to speak that language really easily. I actually first got interested in working for the public sector back when I was production designer in New York. For some reason, again, I was at a party, like so much of my life has happened because I was at a party. I was at a party um, and I met this diplomat from Australia. I don't know why. <laughs> and she was with, yeah, she was with the UN, the UN, like Australia's mission to the United Nations in New York City. And she was saying, okay, well, for the opening of this year's UN year or whatever, we want to do um, like a display on the thermal expansion of seawater, which is primarily why the oceans are rising. It's not because the, the primary reason why the oceans are rising are not because like the, the Arctic is melting. Mm -hmm. It's because when you add carbon to H2O, mm -hmm. that is another molecule and those molecules take up space. And when you have enough molecules to be an ocean – then it becomes like literally bigger, which is what is happening when we, you know, emit a lot of carbon is it goes into the ocean, the ocean absorbs it and the ocean rises. So Australia obviously is a very, very large continent sized island surrounded by lots of smaller islands. They're really concerned about this. They want the UN to take notice. So I read because again, fast reader, good at research. I read like a stack of white papers in like three days. And it was so depressing because it's just like d environmental science is so depressing. Uh. And I was like, I can do this. I can make this installation for you. And they said, great. So I did some really bad drawings and it was like early days of CAD and they were very blocky. And we were signing the contract like that day. And the one person in the world who could like kill this project killed it. It was the finance minister of Australia saw that their mission to the United Nations was going to spend, you know, $50,000 on this thing or whatever it was. And he killed it. And I never thought in my life that my fate would lay in the hands of a bureaucrat on the other side of the planet, but it definitely did. And they killed the project. But what I learned was I'm good at talking to governments. Like I was able to talk to these diplomats. Um, I think it's because of my historian's background. And so when this job at the lab came up, which I saw on Twitter when I was in grad school, I thought, oh, I could do that. Like, I really liked working for the United Nations or for the Australian government for the short time that I did. I think it can make a difference. I'm going to apply. And so you obviously you got accepted and you've been there for a couple of years. And I think that also your language skills and your translating skills also applies here, too. So you're a historian, but being able to translate between bureaucrat speak and design speak and general public concerns is also like a very important way to navigate. It's really hard here at IO. I just spoke at um, I just had like we had like a lunchtime session or whatever. And that was one of the questions that came from a person, I think, who's at IDEO right now, um, the, the firm that's in San Francisco. And they said, you know, how much do you use the language of, say, um, you're going into the the world of the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta? How much do you use their language and how much do you use designers' language? Because I'm from the South and because, you know, this accent is not my real accent. I, I cover my accent every day. And because I was a historian and now I'm a designer, I my answer to this person's question was, as much as possible. I am not afraid to code switch uh -huh. because I think that it is a service to the project. If if they have the the chutzpah to hire a design team to come into the CDC, I want to make it as easy as possible for them to turn around and forward our project together. And part of that is speaking their language yeah. because I can turn around to my design group and and talk all about like all the designy things I want to talk about, like our practice and our space and our like orientation and doubting and skepticism, empathy, all these things. But the epidemiologists at the CDC don't need to hear that. Gotcha. Wow. So fascinating. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. I want to learn a little bit more about this project that you have called Generations. It's something that I'm personally very passionate about. I think Amy is as well, is, is, is diversity and inclusion. So can you talk a little bit about that project? So Generations Project came out of the 2016 election, if I'm honest. So I had just taken this job at the lab. I had moved from Los Angeles, which I love, to back to New York, which was totally fine, but not where I wanted to be. But I really believed in this job, and I really believe that design deserves a place at the highest table. I, I really see myself as a person who can 
forward our work in the greater sphere and give design the dignity it deserves in in as a career path. And then 2016 election happened in November and Donald Trump was elected and that was very surprising I think to a lot of us. And a lot of my friends came to me because I I'm the maker, I'm the one that like does audacious things like take a weird job. And they said, what do we do? We all want to do something. What do we do? And I thought, what do we do? And so we did all the things that people do. We went to marches and we wrote letters. And we, I was at the first women's march and that was great. It was a wonderful moment. But the whole time I was thinking, this is not the most efficient application of my skills. Like, I understand that as a body, I count in a march. Like, you need a mass. That's what a march is. But that is neither a sustainable solution for me as a person living in the United States and dealing with um, the repercussions of my uh, governing mm-hmm. bodies, nor is it a, a particularly useful one, <laughs> really. So I, I designed Generations Project. I feel very passionately that everyone has a way that they can engage with civic society in a sustainable way. And I also feel passionate that we stop telling people that once you're 40, like life is over. I hate that. (laughs) I just can't stand it. Maybe it's the researcher in me. It's like, well, you have to study for many years before you know enough to speak up or whatever it is. But like, I hate those like 30 under 30 lists. Like the hottest designer is who are 35 and under or whatever. I used to see those in New York and be like, that's just a room full of people in a glass building who decided that. Mm -hmm. And while those designers are always very impressive and I'm not saying that I don't want to be, I didn't want to be one. Like, obviously I'm not like immune. I feel really shitty that by the time you're 50, you're like done for that. You have so much more time. Like, you're literally anticipated to be alive until you're like 88. Like we need to, we need to like harvest that talent. It is out there. It is going to be with us. We need to draw that in and make this diversity and inclusion kind of moment that we're having right now extended across age cohorts. I I feel the same way. way. I feel really frustrated because like designers and architects can literally do their work until they die. And also once you hit like 40, just even speaking from personal experience, you have like so many different eye opening views on things. And like you have more confidence and you have more of a worldview and you're able to process information in a different way. And there's so many more perspectives you have as you age. And those are really valuable. So it's really frustrating that like you have to be young to like have this pivotal, you know, important moment. Uh, I can't agree more. And when you're 40, I would like our society to say, you have a ton to contribute. You have your shit figured out. Oh my God. Please tell us all how to figure our shit out. Because when I was 19, I was going to punk rock shows and like getting into fistfights, you know? But that's where I (laughs) figured my shit out at the punk rock shows. Oh my God. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. But like, yeah. Okay. So practically speaking though, like give us the overview. What is Generations Project or what's it supposed to do or how's it supposed to work? It's a weekly email newsletter that you can subscribe to and you take a quiz. So like I love a Cosmo quiz. I think it's like such an amazing design (laughs) innovation is to make a Cosmo quiz. So there's a Cosmo quiz on the website which you can take and it sorts you into one of three categories. There's like energetic, embedded, and and exploring. And roughly they map to these age cohorts. Of course, if you don't have, if you feel like you're still just like want to get out there and be active and you're 32, like you should absolutely do that, even though the age cohort is like 25 and under. But it's useful to have sort of these arbitrary sorting mechanisms as well for for any organization like this. So you take the quiz, you get sorted, and every week you get an email that's suggestions of how you might best leverage your position in life for civic engagement. So if you are young and you want to get your hands dirty and your biggest asset is really time – um, maybe the suggestions will be like there is a march for um, for like rights to abortion near you this week. Like maybe sign up. Here's the link. If you are a person, I'm in the embedded category, so that's age 26 to I think 50. That means we have no time. 
people in that age cohort are typically um, raising families, growing your business, growing your career. It's a very deeply personal internal time and you don't have a lot of time for, for like external public engagement. But what you do have is a ton of connections. I can tell you who to call, especially <laughs> in the government, if you, need, if you need any pointers. I can give you one hour, but I, I can like have a business plan. I can make this happen for you and I can give you advice. So Every week you would get like a, a block of pointers on who might be looking for things that you could help out on That's and how so to great. connect. And then the, thank you. Yeah. And then the exploring is like an older cohort, 51 and older. And this is to help people plan for their retirements. So in working for the Centers for Disease Control, I learned about these rough age cohorts that like large scale science, you know, like public health scientists study and Planning for a transition in life is something that many people do extremely poorly. So I designed uh, Generations Project, the service to, you know, the, this, po- this third tier to help people make those decisions before they get bored and before they develop really bad habits. Because if you retire and you lose those kind of institutional ties that you've been building through your entire career, or if your kids all go to college and you got nothing left, it can be extremely dark. It can be extremely scary for people. And there, all of their potential is lost to the community and to society as a whole if you don't engage them. So, you know, every week you would get a kind of some pointers on like, what are you interested in? Do you feel passionate about registering voters or something like that? Like, this is how you can do it in your area. And so the idea is that Generations Project will connect people across cohorts and also connect them through their sort of generalized orientation to life at that moment to opportunities to engage civically. Wow. That's awesome. So I can sign up right now, (laughs) right? (laughs) Yes. Oh my God, please sign up. It's um, generationsproject.us. And I'm really happy we got that uh, that URL. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we can have a .us URL, <laughs> URL right now, you know? Very cool. Um, I, I feel yeah. so inspired that you've figured out a way to use your sy- systems thinking to, I mean, it's relatively low barrier to entry, right? All you have to do is enter your email address and sign up for this. And then you get the weekly newsletter and you can decide whether you and how you want to participate. But now you have like actionable items that you can take advantage of to to help use what you've got to contribute to society in in ways that people might be confused about how do I go about or overwhelmed about how do I go about doing this? Totally. There's too much out there. And a lot of people think the only way to engage is to like vote or run for office. And like you could not pay me enough money to, to run for office. Like I don't I don't want to do that. But I do, I do know that there are like community boards and committee meetings that need people to take notice. I also did it for a lot of the people like me who have had to move away from where they're from in order to have the life they desire. We feel really unconnected. I think that that is another potential lost and and potential lost really makes me sad. (laughs) So I want to do something about it. (laughs) Good for you. So I hear that you also have a fine art practice that you do. Can you tell us about that part of of you? Oh my gosh. I, yes. Oh, totally. So my fine art practice is usually where I get away from being very practical and earnest. I'm not a do-gooder. I've never wanted to work in a nonprofit. Generations Project is not a nonprofit that I, I seek to establish and carry. It's a call to action, sure. But my main sort of ambition for doing things like this is to both feed and to feed from my fine art practice. So I just started being open about this because coming from a family like mine, where my mother was an immigrant and I studied history because they wanted me to. And the most audacious thing I'd ever done with my career was tell them I wasn't going to go to law school. Being an artist was not Mm. in the cards. Like it was not, I was not permitted to take art classes. Like this was not a thing. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to, I just, I wanted to so badly, but it wasn't serious and you can't make any money at it. And so I didn't, but I've always loved computers and I've always loved drawing. And so I started realizing when I was in grad school, thank God, 
that this wasn't our practice and that what I needed was always to have both sides. I need to have that very practical service design generations project. This is the purpose and how we're going to do it side. And then I need to have this side that's like deeply exploratory, lots of non-focus, lots of weird themes. Those two things feed each other. Um, Throughout my career, I've struggled with the fact that I want both these things. When I was a production designer, they didn't, my, the agents didn't want me to work on fashion. When I was in fashion, agents either wanted me to work on editorial, they wanted me to work on commercial and you couldn't do both. And I always want to do both because I think that that balance is very helpful for me as a designer and an artist. So I keep that up. It's really hard. I'm not going to like sugarcoat it. I often find myself toggling between my three Instagram feeds and being like, why do I do this to myself? (laughs) But I have to. And so I do. (laughs) I feel you that resisting the categorization has always felt like something I couldn't articulate or defend for myself, but I knew it was absolutely important. I I hated in my TV career being called an expert when I didn't, I really just didn't want to carve a groove in one aspect of what I was doing and just, you know, spout tips and tricks about things for the rest of my life. I'm like, what I really am is curious. And I want to go around asking questions and learning new things every day. And how do I make that? um, And how do I apply my skills to that in a way that makes it a valuable contribution to society? But I've always known inherently that, like, if you put me in a box, I'm going to (laughs) die. Totally. And that's one of the things I love about you is, like, your furniture design makes me so happy. (laughs) I I love looking at it. And I also love that you've told me tips and tricks. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. I love it. I love a tip and a trick and also a Cosmo quiz. So, like, I think that embracing complexity would kind of do us all some good, (laughs) you know? Absolutely. And... You brought up complexity. And at the very beginning of this, you also said that you're officially off duty today. So you are allowed to have opinions because I'm allowed to have opinions too. During the workday, as a public servant for the federal government, you have to turn your opinions off. Now, that makes a lot of sense to me because neutrality is probably really important for having a broad perspective and for efficacy. But I want to know, like, on a personal, spiritual, level, is it hard to turn your opinions off? Is it something you had to become very aware of? And does it feel like you're repressing a natural part of your being? Or or is it actually kind of liberating? Like, does it free you to some extent and help you flex your perspective muscles? Oh, God, I really wish I could tell you that it's freeing and it's not. It's horrible. Oh, okay. So, <laughs> yeah, the... The reason why the thing that we I'm responding to when I say that is it's a thing called the Hatch Act. Okay. And basically what the Hatch Act says is that a public servant cannot express uh, support for any political party or campaign while on duty. So the White House has violated the Hatch Act several, many times, dozens of times, in my opinion. I'm not a lawyer, but that's my opinion and I'm off duty, so I get to have opinions. But that that being said, like... I interpret it very um, strictly because I, like you, believe in neutrality and I need to practice, you know, being a public servant for everyone who lives in the United States, not just the people I may agree with. And through this, I have discovered a new happiest moment of the day. Like quite unexpectedly, there is in fact a happiest moment of the day. And that is the moment of the day when you stop working and you can start complaining again. It's... (laughs) so great. And sometimes it's just like, oh my God, I get to have an opinion. And I'll go home to my partner and be like, oh my God, what happened? And he'll tell me all the news because of course I don't read the news while I'm like at work, clearly. And he'll tell me all the news and then we'll just bitch about it. (laughs) It's like so awesome. (laughs) That sounds like the actual like letting off steam. Like it probably builds up all during the day. And then when you get to open that valve, it must feel so like a release. It is. I mean, I wish that it weren't quite so strong a release right now because that would be great. But yeah, yeah, it's definitely a release. It's also, you know, this job has made me really not read the news very much because it's just, it's weird and hard to live with the urgency of supporting our democracy every day. And that sounds super, super dramatic, but like, it's so real. It's so real when you're, yeah, when you're a designer working for the federal government. It's weird. Yeah, I hear you. I bet. 
<laughs> but we're there. We're in it. We're going to do it. We're surviving. Thank you. So I, I'm curious to know too, like how, how are you able to build a personal brand and do things outside of your work? What are things you can and can't say? Like, how do you discuss projects, et cetera? I'm just really interested in, in that whole aspect of it, just because I've never been in a position like that before. This is a really difficult thing that I, I'm still figuring out. As a civil servant, the, the purpose is for you to not seek the spotlight as an individual, because what you're trying to do is to build the strength of the institutions. So if you've you know been listening to the news or reading the news lately, you'll talk about, you'll hear talk about like our democratic institutions. And that's because to make a sustainable civic society that is fair and equitable to as many people as possible, obviously deeply imperfect, you have to create strong institutions and institutions are not individuals. So how as a designer in our federal government do I both serve the needs of my career, that is, you know, doing branding things, showing up for panels, doing uh, interviews like this, and at the same time contribute to creating strong institutions? And the answer is we're not sure. Like the lab is a space and a practice and we're all trying to figure it out together. Something that I'm really grateful for is that I can show my work that I'm very proud of. Like I'm, I'm very proud that even though in the federal government, we, I, I'm never going to be able to work on a fancy VR headset. It's just not in the cards. The constraints are too high, but I do get to make meaningful things that have a huge impact and I can share them. Whereas a lot of my private sector colleagues just have this like white space in their portfolios. If you work at like, I don't know, HP or wherever, and you signed an NDA. So it's true. We talk to designers all the time and they're like, I'm working on this great project. I just can't tell you about it. It's a continual frustration for them because they are absolutely trying to serve the needs of their career, but not being able to talk about any of their projects is quite a tension. And you're kind of in the opposite space where it's like, my work is in the public domain, so I can talk about it. I'm just not supposed to seek the spotlight. So I have to be really measured in how I do that. And at the same time, I feel this is where Jamie and I come in. I feel like it's really important for us to know what you guys are doing and how you're doing it and why you're doing it. And so you have to be able to talk about it. (laughs) Right. And I keep telling my leadership this. We have to talk about it. And and it's a it's like a lot of things. The precedent is for absolutely the absolute most conservative interpretation of the law and of policy guidelines. And that is just to say nothing. And I have to admire the work of uh, groups like 18F in the United States um, and also USDS, which is the U.S. Digital Service. They have been able to talk about their work, and it has done a huge deal for making public service a viable decision for for designers at any age, um, whether you're you know graduating for undergrad or if you are mid career, whatever you're doing. Like they have surfaced us and I'm so grateful and we're trying to figure out how to do that better while at the same time, you know, continuing to serve the very important role of like building strong democratic institutions. So, yeah. Okay, so I have kind of a different question, but I feel like we need to talk about money because I don't understand how you're getting paid and you do so many different things. The Generations Project is is something you've self-initiated I don't know if you have a grant and you don't, I mean, I'm just saying like you pursue so many different creative endeavors and it seems like the form of funding is varied and some of them are not funded at all. And it's not like you have like a lifetime job with a company that's paying you a paycheck. You have uh, a lot of different things going on, your fine art career, all of that. How do you keep financial anxiety at bay? while you allow yourself to be open to pursue your curiosities and lend your talents to the greater good? I was very adamant that I I would have a living at being a designer. I, I, again, one of the reasons why I moved into film is because of the unions. The unions would guarantee that you were getting paid a living wage. There were so many days when I worked in fashion that I ran the numbers and I was getting paid less than minimum wage mm-hmm. for hard work. Mm-hmm that sold purses or panties or whatever you were selling that day. And it it felt really bad. And so this job that I have, this fellowship that I have, they pay us fairly. And I think that that's, that's an important principle of 
our group that you deserve to be compensated at a level that is commiserate, not as high, but at least comparable to some of your private sector colleagues. The other thing that I love about being a public servant is that they don't work you to death. Mm. You know, I'm not, I'm not pulling a hundred hour week. And if I did pull a hundred hour week, they would pay me for that. They wouldn't pay me in, in cash. You get paid in like vacation days and things like that. But like, that's not part of the culture. And I don't think it should be part of our culture at large. Like it makes me very sad when I hear about designers staying at work at their computers until midnight or whatever. Cause I'm like, you need to go out and you need to feed your, your, you know, fine art practice, or you need to completely forget about design entirely because they're just being wrung dry. And I don't think that's fair. I am so with you on that. And I feel like we do society a great disservice if we wring our creatives dry, if we try to squeeze every, you know, them, all of their productivity out of them on our schedule. We don't end up with creatives that can actually come up with the solutions that we are counting on them for, creatives that can actually yeah. stay doing the job for a while. We get people dissuading their kids from becoming creatives because either they think you can't make any money or you get wrung dry. I just don't think it's healthy for society to do that. It's really not. And I think that that's, that's one of the big drivers that I have for being such a kind of, I don't know, for lack of a better word, like policy wonk on what it is to be a designer and be a creative um, right now, because I, I don't think it's sustainable. I think you're totally right. And I don't want to see people making a decision to not be a creative. We need you. We need your ideas. We need your energy. And we need to take care of you. And that is a choice we make as a society that we can change. Yeah. Yeah. Do it. I'm counting on you, yeah. Anna Monroe. <laughs> oh, my God. I, you can do I it. I think you are doing your we'll, part, We'll do it together. All the we'll things that you're already doing are contributing. I mean, you might not think it, but every drop in the bucket counts, you know? Totally. I really hope that um, people see public service as a way to uh, make enough money to live, uh, to to not work a thousand mm -hmm. million hours and to serve to serve society in a way that it doesn't have to be for your whole life. I'm not going to be in the government forever. I can tell you that right now. I love private practice. I love having my own business. But it's it's great to do right now, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So speaking of all these things that you're doing, we're interested in legacy. Have you thought about legacy at all? Yes. I, I it's a big question. It's it's a definitely a big question for me because I take it extremely seriously. My biggest hope is that I can show people that as, first of all, that as women, we deserve a seat at the table. We are, we are going to do this. Yeah. And I cannot, I'm like, I'm like choking up. I'm Hell like so passionate. Hell fucking yeah, me this. too. I feel um, it. We're totally doing it. <laughs> and, and as we can be women designers, you do, it, it, I love all my project managers. They, I could not do my job without them. They're so wonderful. I don't know how they do all the things that they do. But if you don't want to do that because, and you're, and you're a woman, don't get pushed out because the boys tell you, you need to organize my life, which is a dichotomy I've seen a lot in my career. I don't know about y'all. So I, one of my biggest things is like, I want to be an advocate for creative women who have, who make enough money to, to live their lives, to be independent. And if I can show anyone of any age that that is an option, whether you have just gotten a divorce and you're 45, you can do it. You can get on this wagon and we can do this together. If you're 20, this is a possibility for you. I feel really passionate that that can be my legacy as like a female leader as a creative. The other thing is all the stuff I've already said about uh, creating a space for design at the most powerful tables. Every single thing. And one of the things I love about Clever is that, you know, you all say the designed world, mm -hmm. right? Like everything, everything has been designed, much of it unintentionally. Right. And that is not good enough for us. That is not good enough. And we are going to change that and we are going to make better and more intentional design. I'm drinking the Kool-Aid. I'm. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you are speaking straight to my heart, lady, and I love hearing it, and I love what you're doing. So, keep on keeping on. You all too. I just love. I love. I love. I love listening to this. This, and I love being part of the space. So, thank you for the for having me. Amazing. So, 
You've talked about a lot of different things that you're doing. Is there something that you missed that you would like to make sure our listeners know about? Or do you want to just share all the social media profiles and websites you have um, so everybody can follow <laughs> I mean, you everywhere? <laughs> oh, yeah. So it would be amazing um, if you check out Generations Project. Um, the IG is generationsproject.us. And the it's also on Facebook. The website is generationsproject.us. So definitely check that out, especially as we come up to 2020, y'all. You got to, we got to get in there. <laughs> it takes all, it takes all of us. Yeah. If you want to check out my fine art, it's at Fitzy Fitzy Fitz, uh, which is my art handle on Instagram. I was given that name by an ex bandmate. Um, so there it is. <laughs> Fitzy Fitzy Fitz. <laughs> And my personal accounts and at Anna Monroe. Feel free to check that out too. It's mostly tacos and rainbows. It's not. It's there's nothing insightful up there. But I have, take a lot of good pictures of like buildings. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you so much, and I hope to see you soon. Take care. Thanks for listening. To see images of Anna's work and read the show notes, click the link in the details of this episode on your podcast app, or go to cleverpodcast.com, where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Subscribe to Clever on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would please do us a favor, rate and review us. We really appreciate it. And if you love Clever, it's so helpful if you leave us a review or just rate us. We also love hearing from you on social media. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. Clever is created and produced and hosted by us, Amy Devers and Jamie Derringer, also known as 2VDE Media, with editing by Rich Straffolino and music by L1011. Clever is proudly distributed by Design Milk.